This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to Nebula, a video streaming service made by your favorite educational creators when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. This is South India, home to the biodiversity hotspots, the Western and Eastern Ghats, the Bengal Tiger, the Nilgiri Tar, the Indian Elephant, and whatever this creature is. Here is also the cradle of Tamil culture. Today, there are about 80 million Tamils in the world. That's more than there are French, Colombians, or Kenyans. Most Tamils live in North and East Sri Lanka or in the Southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu, literally Tamil country. Tamil Nadu is now a state in modern India, but for thousands of years, Tamilikam, or the homeland of the Tamils, was much larger and ruled by independent kingdoms. Tamil culture is the last surviving classical civilization because they've managed to keep their beliefs, culture, and language intact for over 2000 years. But who are the Tamils? What is their story? And what does it have to do with $700 billion golden coconuts? Well, let's find out. The Tamils, maybe more than any other people, are in love with their language. Tamil writing has been dated as far back as the 6th century BCE, from the archaeological site Kairadi in India, and from the 2nd century BCE at Punakari in Sri Lanka, making it one of the oldest datable languages still in use. Tamils often call their language Tamartai, which means the Tamil mother. It's more important to the Tamil identity than land, race, or religion. If you want to have the most intense conversation of your entire life, just go ask a Tamil person anything about the Tamil language. Tamils also take pride in the independent origin of their language. See, you can roughly divide India linguistically in half. North Indians generally speak languages descended from Sanskrit, an Indo-European language. This language family stretches from North India all the way over to Iceland. South Indian languages like Tamil belong to a completely unrelated language family called Dravidian. Unlike Sanskrit, which like Latin is no longer spoken, modern Tamil survives as a living language for millions of speakers. Dravidians do not like it when North India tries to push its culture or language on the south. The earliest clear evidence of Tamil people are urn burials dating from around 1000 BCE at Aditch Anilore. Amazingly, they found evidence there of the worship of a god with a trident and a peacock, very like the Hindu Tamil's favourite god today, Murugan. But the Tamils really leap into world history when the Maurya Emperor Ashoka mentions the unconquerable Southern Tamil kingdoms in his rock inscriptions made between 273 and 232 BCE. Which is impressive when you consider the fact that the Maurya Empire essentially conquered everything else. This is right around the beginning of a Tamil golden age known as the Sangam period, lasting from the 3rd century BCE to the 3rd century CE. At this time, Tamilicum was ruled by three Tamil dynasties, the Solas, the Seras and the Panjas. Unfortunately, there were no actual pandas in the Panja kingdom. I know, I know. The Tamil kings were immeasurably rich and used their wealth to sponsor century-long poetry slams called the Sangams at the Panja capital, Madurai, where male and female poets would show off their works. These poets created thousands of poems, books and epic stories called Sangam literature. Sangam literature is unique in how it doesn't seem to belong to any single class or religion. It was written by and concerns Hindus, Jains, men, women, farmers, kings, pandas, non-pandas, and everyone in between. One great Sangam poet, Poon Koon Krenar, emphasized the equality of all humans, saying, I am a citizen of the world, and everyone in the world is related to me. This was quoted by one of India's most beloved presidents, the Tamil Muslim aerospace scientist Abdul Kalam at the European Parliament in 2007. The Sangam literature tells us about a rich, cosmopolitan and multi-ethnic Tamil-speaking society 2000 years ago, where Hinduism, Jainism and Buddhism all coexisted peacefully, where kings would even invite priests to public debates on their beliefs. Sangam poems describe Madurai as so rich that it had a moat with secret underground passages large enough for elephants, Greek mercenaries guarded its gates, and the scent of perfume could be smelled miles away from the city, where there were folks of every race buying and selling in the bazaars or singing to the music of wandering bands. So how were the Tamils so rich? They were spicy. The ancient world was a bland, flavourless, unseasoned mess. It tasted a lot like English food. 
This was until the Tamils taught everyone the way of the spice. A 1st century CE Greek manual for sailors, the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, says that the Tamils exported pepper and other spices along with diamonds, woven textiles, pearls, ivory, malabatrum and other luxury items. What's malabatrum? Who cares? It sounds luxurious though. Another major export was cotton and silk clothing woven by women. Indian women would dominate this global trade for the next 2000 years. Tamils traded so much that Pliny the Elder said India takes 100 million sesterces from our empire per year at a conservative estimate. That's about 10 tons of gold. China had the Silk Road, the Tamils had the... Flavor Highway? No, the Spice Boulevard. Whatever. They made themselves the centre of a global trade network that linked Europe, the Middle East, Africa, India, Southeast Asia and China. We've discovered massive hordes of Chinese, Iranian and Roman coins along the ancient Tamil coast. Tamil inscriptions have been found as far apart as Egypt and Thailand. A statue of the Hindu goddess Lakshmi got buried at Pompeii. And Tamil ambassadors met with Augustus Caesar in 20 CE. This trade made Tamil cooking the first international cuisine in the world. The word orange comes from the Tamil naram. Ginger comes from Tamil Inchiver, and rice in loads of European languages comes from the Tamil Arisi. Without the Tamils, Ireland's greatest contribution to world cuisine, the spice bag, would not exist. And honestly, I don't want to live in that kind of world. One Roman cookbook had over 300 recipes using Indian spices from ostrich curry to tasty peppered brain sausage, or everyone's favourite, another laxative. Link to the cookbook is in the description, in case you need a laxative. Tamils got so rich off of their trade routes that just one temple, the Patmanapasvami temple, whose vaults were recently opened, has a treasure worth over $700 billion. This was accumulated over thousands of years from the donations from Tamil dynasties like the Seras, the Panjas, the Pallavas and the Solas. Some of the things in the temple include this golden Mahavishnu statue, tens of thousands of gold coins, a solid gold throne, golden elephants, a 5 meter long diamond necklace and my personal favourite, a 30 kilogram solid gold coconut. At what point does that stop being a coconut and start being a bowling ball? There are still unopened vaults in this temple, so we're still unsure of how much it's worth. Tamil merchants, monks and craftspeople worked across Southeast Asia and lived in small communities there. Tamil merchants didn't just trade pepper with Southeast Asia, they traded the spiciest thing of all. Ideas. From the 4th century CE on, kingdoms from Thailand to Vietnam to Indonesia were ruled by Hindu kings and wrote using Tamil writing. Modern Khmer, Javanese and Thai scripts all descend from the Tamil Pallava script. The greatest monument to this cultural exchange is the originally Hindu temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia, the largest religious structure on earth. By the end of the 13th century we even find the Tamil Hindu temple dedicated to Shiva all the way over in the Chinese part of Qinzhou, where a small Tamil community lived. The wealth and fame of the Tamil lands invited more than just merchants. A small Jewish community could be found in Kochi from the 6th century BCE. More even came as refugees after the destruction of the second temple in 70 CE. And according to local tradition, the Jews were followed by Saint Thomas, the apostle of Jesus, who landed in India in 52 CE and started converting people to Christianity. From Thomas, India's current Syrian Christian community claims descent. In 629 CE, a mosque was built by Muslim merchants in Muziris, and you can still go visit it today, or a part of it at least, because the Portuguese blew it up in 1504, but like, it's still cool, you can still see some of it. Okay, so we're going to do a little time jump here. Let's see, invaded by Buddhist warrior tribes, Jainism and Buddhism take over for a bit, rise of the Pallava dynasty, Hindu revival, ah, here it is. After the Sangha period, the next great Tamil golden age happened under the Sola dynasty, between the 9th and 13th centuries. Their greatest king, Raja Raja Sola, rose to the throne in 985 CE. He and his son quickly turned his modest kingdom into an empire that conquered most of South India, Sri Lanka and the Maldives. The Sola used their massive navy, the largest in Asia at the time, to control the trade routes between Southeast Asia and China. 
When the Srivijaya Empire threatened to block Sola access to the Straits of Malacca, the Solas launched massive naval attacks across Indonesia and Malaysia and even kidnapped the Srivijaya king. And no one ever messed with their trade routes ever again. Along with an army containing 60,000 war elephants, the Sola king's personal guard included the Padimuglir, or women bodyguards trained in Tamil martial arts and weapons. There are also mentions of women working as advisors and ambassadors, and using their own money to make large donations to temples. Raja Raja Sola poured his enormous wealth into building massive temples in a style called Dravidian architecture. The most well known of these being the Raja Raja Jaiswara temple in Tanjavur. This 66 meter tall soaring monument to Raja Raja was one of the tallest buildings in the world at the time. Other than Raja Raja temple, other Sola slash Dravidian architecture is also breathtaking. Like the Iyara Teswara temple, the Kanki Kanta Solapuram temple and the Champa Karesuvarara temple. Sola temples also acted as banks. These temples received massive donations from the royals and then they offered loans from those donations to farmers, villages and merchants. Sola temples became this weird vehicle for redistributing wealth and reinvesting it in arts and local communities, making everyone richer. It's no wonder why when Marco Polo came here in 1273, he called the Sola lands the richest province on earth. Sola power declined in the 12th and 13th centuries. Buddhism and Islam replaced Hinduism in Southeast Asia and Tamil lands in Kerala drifted away and developed their own language and culture, which resulted in the modern Malayalam language. Okay, so we're going to need to do another time jump. You have Muslim invasions from the north, rise of the Vijayanagarap who build the world's second largest city, arrival of the Portuguese, destruction of the Vijayanagarap by Muslim armies, Tamil lands fracture into small states and ah, here it is. No, 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 it can't be, not you. Not you again. Tally ho, it is a smashing civilization you've got there. It would be a shame if someone were to plunder it. Tamilicum was split into small competing states in the 17th century, which made it easier for the newly arriving European powers to invade. By the end of the 18th century, most of South India was under British rule. The Tamils resisted the British invasions. One example is that of the Queen of Shivaganga, Velu Nachiar. To protect her kingdom from invasion, she built an army to resist the British imperialists. This army included a regiment of women soldiers. One of them, Kulili, volunteered to destroy a vital British ammunition depot that was located inside a temple. Kulili and her fellow warriors easily entered the temple as worshippers because the British taught women were harmless. Unable to sneak weapons in, they poured oil over Kulili who then set herself on fire and leapt into the ammunition depot, blowing it up and securing victory for her queen in the following battles, becoming the first woman martyr in India's long battle for freedom. Despite acts like this, by 1858, the British crown had seized control of all of India. Famine quickly swept South India between 1876 and 1878, killing 8 million people. With the area devastated by famine, the British could dismantle the over 2,000 year old Tamil textile industry. As British textile manufacturers couldn't compete with Tamil textiles, so they destroyed all the Indian looms. Then they pushed Tamils out of work as craftspeople and onto tea, sugar, coffee and opium plantations in India or sent them off across their empire as indentured servants. John Sullivan, a colonial official in southern India, said, under their own dynasties, all the revenue that was collected in the country was spent in the country. Our system acts very much like a sponge, drawing up all the good things from the banks of the Ganges and squeezing them out on the banks of the Thames. India would eventually win its independence from Britain in 1947. In the first two decades of Indian independence, language became a battlefield in India. In 1950, Hindi, the most spoken language in India, was selected as the sole official language of the country, with 1965 picked as the year the changeover from English would happen. Speakers of the Dravidian languages in the south didn't like Hindi because it was Sanskrit based, which they considered more alien than English. As 1965 approached, thousands of Tamil student protesters shouted, Hindi never, English ever, in the streets of Seni. Four students set themselves on fire as a symbol of non-violent protest. Dravidian political parties made it clear that if Hindi became the official language of India, then Tamil Nadu would secede from India. The protesters won, 
the Official Languages Act Amendment of 1967 ensured the continued use of English alongside Hindi as the official language of India up until today. Even now in India, Tamil Nadu is famous for its independent streak, love of its culture and language, and for acting as the champion of Dravidian politics against the North. But Tamils don't only live in Tamil Nadu. Just a few kilometres away from there is the island nation known today as Sri Lanka, where Tamils make up 15% of the population. Sri Lanka is home to several ethnic groups. The mostly Buddhist Sinhalese are the majority, and the mostly Hindu Tamils are the second largest group. Both groups have been on the island for over 2,000 years. This island was known as Ceylon when it suffered three centuries of colonialism under Portugal, the Netherlands and then their British Empire took over in 1796. When the British arrived they were like, how can I make everything worse? Oh, let's introduce inter-ethnic conflict. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, to spur hatred, the British chose Tamils for higher positions than the Sinhalese in the government. Then, in the Sri Lankan highlands, Sinhalese lands were seized by the British and enslaved Tamils from India were settled there as plantation workers. These are Indian Tamils, distinct from the Sri Lankan Tamils who have lived in Sri Lanka for much, much longer. Sri Lankan Tamils live in the north and east, Indian Tamils live in the central highlands and the Sinhalese live essentially everywhere else. When the British got kicked out of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, in 1948, the majority Sinhalese took control of the island. Sinhalese nationalism exploded, and soon anti-Tamil massacres swept the island in 1956, 1958 and 1977, which led to the formation of a guerrilla fighting group known as the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, better known as the Tamil Tigers. On the 31st of May 1981, the Sri Lankan police burned the Jaffna Public Library to the ground, home to 97,000 books and containing irreplaceable artefacts of Tamil history. Seeing the fire, one Tamil refugee said, It was as if my entire biography, my history and the history of the Tamils had been destroyed, wiped from the face of the earth as if we did not exist. On July 23rd, 1983, the Tamil Tigers ambushed and killed 15 Sri Lankan soldiers, causing another anti-Tamil massacre to sweep the country in an event known as Black July. The Sri Lankan civil war had begun. The Tamil Tigers were fighting for an independent Tamil nation in the Tamil parts of the island. As the war dragged on over decades, the Tamils became infamous for inventing the explosive suicide vest and for carrying out a suicide bombing campaign across Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan army retaliated with brutal attacks against the Tamil Tigers, which mostly resulted in the deaths and displacement of tens of thousands of innocent Tamil civilians. The Sri Lankan state is still undergoing investigations for committing a genocide against the Tamils. This bloody war dragged on for 26 years, until the 18th of May 2009, when the leader of the Tamil Tigers, V. Pirapakaran, was killed and the Tigers surrendered. The war took the lives of over 100,000 people, with 40,000 Tamil civilians being killed in the final few months of the war. These are rough estimates because a proper investigation hasn't been done. The war caused a mass exodus of Sri Lankan Tamil refugees to India, Australia, Europe and North America. Today around 8 million Tamils live outside of India and Sri Lanka. From the 19th century onwards they went as indentured labourers across the British Empire, especially to Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, Fiji, Mauritius and the Caribbean, where many have kept their Tamil identities. Tamil is actually an official language in Singapore and Malaysia. Well, I think now it's time to take a look at Tamil culture. Religion Today about 88% of the Tamil population of Tamil Nadu are Hindus, 6% are Christians, 5.8% are Muslims and Jains, Buddhists and Sikhs make up the rest. The most important Tamil festival is Thai Pankal, a harvest festival dedicated to the Hindu sun god Surya that usually occurs on the 14th of January. This festival is celebrated by all Tamils regardless of religion though. Pankal means to boil or overflow and refers to the traditional dish of new harvest rice boiled in milk with raw sugar. Pankal celebrations include decorating cows, ritual bathing, parades, prayers, dances, creating art and getting together with friends and family and exchanging gifts. During Pankal in Tamil Nadu you might also see a Jalikutta. In this over 2000 year old sport 
an Indian bull is released into a crowd of people, and men attempt to grab the hump on the bull's back with both arms and hang onto it for as long as possible, attempting to bring the bull to a full stop, thus taming the bull. If they do so, they get a prize. If no one tames the bull, the owner of the bull gets a prize. There have been many attempts to ban this sport in recent years, which has caused massive popular backlash. Another interesting Tamil holiday is a May festival for the god Aravan, who is worshipped by transgender people called Tevrunar in Tamil. At this annual festival at Kovakam, you'll see ceremonial marriages between festival goers and the god Aravan, along with beauty pageants and dances hosted with the support of the Tamil Nadu government. In 2008, Tamil Nadu became the first state in India to allow people to legally identify as a third gender. Arts Tanjavur paintings and solar bronzes are some of the Tamil's greatest contributions to world art. But one of the more humble yet distinct features of Tamil art is the kolam, which decorates the front of almost every Tamil home. These are geometrical and floral designs made of rice flour. Each day the kolam is crafted by women and then erased the next morning to make room for a new one. Today, in Tamil Nadu, huts to five-star hotels will all have a kolam. One of the most treasured pieces of Tamil literature is the Tirukural by Tiruvulavar, which has its origins in the Sangam period but was finalised a few centuries after. This is a masterpiece in ethics and living well. The Tirukural is made up of three books of wise sayings on virtue, wealth and love, all delivered in quick two-line poems. For example, the greatest virtue of all is non-killing, truthfulness cometh only next. It also just stops midway and talks about how to build good forts and I'm always down for some fort talk. Charity and kindness are also key aspects and it emphasises non-violence and vegetarianism. Avoidance of killing and eating the meat of even one animal is more meritorious than a thousand sacrifices. The Tirukural is vital to Tamil culture. It pops up in songs, films and books. Every bus in Tamil Nadu is legally obligated to have a verse from the Tirukural on it. One of the Tamil's most famous dances is Paratanateum. This dance tells a story through complicated mudras or hand gestures, facial expressions and body posture. It also just looks incredible. Food Rice is the staple of the mostly vegetarian Tamil diet. Bananas and plantains, jackfruit, coconut, lentils, tamarind and mango are also commonly used ingredients along with a huge amount of spices. Traditionally, a Tamil meal is eaten off of a banana leaf. Some favourite Tamil foods include the light and fluffy idli, the fried and spicy vadai, the crispy dosa and the delicious fried banana bonda. And no Tamil dish is complete without a side of sambar, chutney or in Sri Lanka, coconut sambal. Tamils also love their coffee, which they brew in this unique South Indian device. Cinema Tamil people are passionate about cinema. Based in the Kodobakum neighbourhood in Sena, the Tamil film industry or Kollywood is the second largest film industry in India. Mani Ratnam's gangster epic Nayakam was included in Time magazine's 100 best movies of all time list. I actually watched a movie with one of Tamil cinema's superstars, Rajinikant, where this happens and it was an absolutely amazing few hours. Tamil cinema has even bled into Tamil politics. Three chief ministers of the Tamil Nadu state have risen out of Tamil cinema. Tamil cinema acts as a way for Tamils to preserve their independent and original culture by producing films in the Tamil language based on Tamil ideas and culture. I wish there were something like that for YouTubers, so they could create independent and high quality educational content for people that just love learning. Oh wait, Cogito and a bunch of our creator friends got together and made our own platform called Nebula, and we're excited to be partnering with CuriosityStream. Nebula is a place where you can watch some of the best educational content ad-free, uncensored and earlier than YouTube. This video was up on Nebula days ago and there creators can also experiment with all kinds of new and exclusive content. This channel has exclusive content up on Nebula and by supporting Nebula you'll be providing a budget for creators to put out Nebula originals that would never make it on YouTube. Take for example Tom Scott's new game show Money where he turns some of your favourite creators against each other for fun and profit or Real Engineering's Nebula original, The Logistics of D-Day. It's an incredible World War II docu-series that dives deep into a topic that YouTube's algorithm would bury. There are many, many more Nebula originals, all funded by and created for people like you, people that enjoy original, independent and smart content. And now Nebula even has original podcasts. But what does CuriosityStream have to do with this? Well, 
CuriosityStream is the best place to find world-class documentaries online, so we've teamed up and created a deal. If you follow the link in the description and sign up for CuriosityStream's annual subscription, you'll get access not only to CuriosityStream's entire catalogue of thousands of documentaries, but you'll also get access to Nebula for free. And that's not a trial or anything like that. As long as you're signed up to CuriosityStream, you'll get Nebula. And right now, for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering Cogito viewers a 41% discount on their annual subscription. That's less than $15 a year for CuriosityStream and Nebula. I just finished watching their new documentary, Treasures of the Earth, which is about indigenous peoples around the world. So if you like this video, you'll love that documentary. Unlike us, they actually have a budget to go and fly around the world and film these people, rather than drawing cute, chunky versions of them like we do. So click the link below to get 41% off the annual CuriosityStream subscription along with free access to Nebula. Or you can just go to curiositystream.com forward slash cogito. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. What people would you like us to cover next? You can find all the sources used in the description. If you're interested in supporting this channel, you can find our Patreon and merch store also linked down below. Our patrons get early access to all of our videos and a peek behind the scenes along with knowing that these videos would not be possible without them. So thank you so much for watching and poi tu varen.